So, the beginnings of my earliest childhood memories include the sound of the streetcar <laughs> as it travels the six miles from Hagerstown to Williamsport back in the 1930s and 40s. And stops at the halfway stop in the 1700 block of Virginia Avenue, just south of Nursery Road. In the yard of a two, uh, two it's like a double brick house, stands a limestone marker, if you like, a little tombstone almost, and on the surface of this marker, it says 3H3W, signify the three miles from that point to Hagerstown and three miles to Williamsport. Now this halfway uh, stop in the trolley line in the 30s and 40s was probably responsible for the beginnings of the development of the whole community of halfway. Now, Hagerstown is the largest, larger of the two towns at either end of the trolley system, the streetcar system, but Williamsport has its own claim to fame as well. Some of you know this. If you go to Williamsport today, you'll notice that the streets are way wider than they typically would, would need to be. And the story goes that in the early days of the country, they were on some kind of a short list Trying to, be, trying to be chosen as the capital of the country. And they made their streets extra wide just in case, mm -hmm. or as, a, as an incentive perhaps. But obviously they weren't chosen as the capital of the country. Some other swampy town down at the mouth of the river uh, was chosen instead. But those streets are extra wide to this very day. But I, and, and the other free-range children that lived in Halfway in the 1950s, we already knew that Halfway was what we called the capital of the world. <laughs> the capital of the world, now think about that. Well, at least it was a, the, the center of our universe anyway. Now, now my, my grandfather, Poole, was one of the operators of, of the streetcar. And when they pulled the tracks up in 1949, when I was barely two years old, they replaced it with a bus system, and he drove the bus. And then he started a little store on Lincoln Avenue, catty corner across from Old Lincoln School in the, in the early 50s called Pool Store. Now Pool Store was the, one of the anchors of the community because it had the post office in there and people didn't have to go the the three miles to Hagerstown and Williamsport. Now, now, if you went in the front door and went back in the back, far right back corner, there was a little postal window back there. But next to the postal window was my favorite place. There was a big oak glass front case called the Penny Candy Counter. <laughs> and they must have had 50 different kinds of penny candy in that case. But around the corner from that was a low chest freezer with big tubs of Hershey's ice cream. Now, if you had a nickel in the 50s, you could get, you'd get yourself a three penny stamp to mail a letter, and you'd have two pennies left over to visit the, the penny candy counter. And if you had a nickel and you didn't need a, a stamp, you could buy yourself five pieces of penny candy, or a candy bar, or a Coke, or an ice cream cone. A nickel. Now my mama wouldn't let us mooch at the store, even that was owned by, by our extended family. So she would send us to the, to the store with, with a nickel if she had one. But then, knowing my grandmother Poole was, uh, was a soft touch, we would give her the nickel and then she would let us dip her own ice cream. <laughs> and uh, then We'd sit on those little swivel stools and turn around and around and eat the ice cream. And uh, if she got busy back in the corner at the post office, we might just go back over for another 
they have a totally different flavor. And the game in the at Poole store in the 50s was to see how many different flavors you could eat before you got caught or before you got sick, whichever came first. Now, in the backyard pool store was a big cherry tree that grew there, and uh, along about the time school was letting out, about the second week in June, the cherries got ripe, and the game in the backyard was to climb out on that cherry tree and out in the branches where the ripe, sweet, white cherries were and see how many you could eat before you fell out of the tree. Now, if that wasn't enough to, to make your summer start your summer great. The third thing happened, the, the trifecta of the, of the beginning of the summer, the Volunteer Fireman's Carnival. Now, some big old trucks would pull in there on a Sunday evening with the rides put together to make the carnival the next day. And in the bottom of the big truck was the, the huge pieces to put together to make the tallest a carnival ride on the wall. That's the, the Ferris wheel. It, it, it was like a put together a big uh, erector set. It was fascinating to watch him do it. Now, now when I was very young, when I was very young, I always watched them and I always noticed I had a couple pieces left over. And I was a little leery about getting on that <laughs> Ferris wheel because I was convinced that they had forgotten some pieces. Well. When, and, and it wasn't safe to get on there. But, but now when I got a little older, I realized that they probably had some spare parts. Now there was two big tents at the carnival. The one close to the schoolhouse was the, um, was the food tent. Our, our aunt, Rhea Grove, who was the chief cook and bottle washer at the school, and later at Lincolnshire School, she uh, was in charge of the food tent, but the other tent was dedicated to the game of bingo. And my grandmother loved to go over there with, with her friends in the evening and, and do, do the bingo games. Well, they used those old cardboard cards with, with, with little pieces of yellow uh, hard corn that they would lay on the surface of the, of the card. And they would, uh, that way they could remember the, you know, the numbers that were already uh, called. But my favorite game at the carnival was the penny pinch. Not because I wanted to throw my money away in the evening at the carnival time, but the next morning after the carnival, we would go over in the early morning and the carnies would still be sleeping in their, their little uh, camp trailers and we'd sneak in there and we'd pick up any pennies that would fall off the platform the night before in the dirt and the dust. And we would get a pot full of pennies and back across that street we'd go back to pool store and line, up at, and line up at the penny candy counter and life was really good in the capital of the world. <laughs> now my my other grandparents on the Hayes part of the family they lived up in the suburbs of uh, halfway up on the other end of um, Kaufman Avenue and uh, we always call it our grandfather Pap Hayes but I'm pretty sure his, his um, best friends called him Lefty as he was missing his right arm. I, I think uh, Barry remembers this. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's, it, it goes that he lost his arm in an industrial accident working at the Fairchild factory in Hextown, uh, helping to make the um, airplanes for the war effort. And he got both arms accidentally caught in some big metal stamping machine and he lost one arm and he almost lost the other. Now, now Pat Hayes then was uh, forced to be, uh, to, to, to be retired since he was disabled, but he always wore long sleeve shirts. I guess he was a little nervous about showing that stub of that arm that he had lost. But that shirt sleeve he didn't need was always neatly folded and tucked inside his front shirt pocket. And in the other shirt pocket, he had he usually had two or three big old cigars in there, <laughs> as he was a cigar smoker in those days. Now, Grandma Ames wouldn't let him smoke in the house, so he had to go out to the backyard. But in the dead, cold, icy part of the winter, he had to go in the basement. And he would sit down on one of the steps at the bottom of the steps at the basement, and he would smoke his cigar. And he had a whole lot of time on his hands 
correction. He had a whole lot of time on his hand. <laughs> and, and he remembered that, that, that there was a group of power tools, uh, woodworking tools, way back in the far corner. And he, he, somebody had given them to him, but, but he never had a chance to learn how to use them. But again, he had a whole lot of time on his hand. So he decided to teach himself how, how to use those power tools. He had, a, he had a wood lathe, he had a bandsaw and a table saw and a big bench with a vise. Now you can imagine how useful a vise is to a one-armed cabinet maker. So he taught himself how to use those tools and um, he, in the next decade or so, he made every stick of wooden furniture in his six-room home, including a four-poster black walnut bed or for the bedroom. Now, his two favorite woods were black walnut and white cherry. The, uh, hey, hey, come on in here, my friend. <laughs> so, his two favorite woods were black walnut and white cherry. And the doctors in the, uh, we're talking about my granddaddy, who you know, didn't have his arm, he was missing his arm, remember him? <laughs> so, uh, so the doctors and the physical therapists, they, they, they wanted him to strengthen that arm. Uh, the one that he almost lost, and so he, he got another idea. He decided not to paint on his finishes with polyurethane or varnish, anything like that. His furniture was all made with, um, were, were hand rubbed with six coats of boiled linseed oil and a whole lot of left-handed elbow grease. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the in the late '60s, the old cherry tree in the back of pool store died. And uh, Pat Hayes convinced someone to cut it down to uh, cut it up into boards for him. And in 1969, when that little lady there and I decided to get married, uh, our one-armed granddaddy made us a wedding gift. He made a beautiful cherry table with turned legs, a drawer and a fine uh, hand rub uh, finish for a wedding gift. That's just over 50 years ago now. Now, halfway is not the same as it was in the 50s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. The two interstate high highways came in there and the, the Valley Mall is only the beginning of the of the you know the commercial development. You know, the old school was torn down. They put a new fire hall up there, but it's not so new anymore, I bet. <laughs> but uh, pool store is gone and there's nothing left but some memories, you know, for those free range kids that lived there in the fifties. And some of us, or most of us, are in our 60s and 70s now, believe it or not. But uh, maybe you have some memories of those days. But, but for me, all I have to do is put my hand on the, the surface of that, that cherry table. And it takes me all the way back. All the way back over half a century. I can, I can close my eyes and my mind's eye, I can see me and my brother Clay and some other guys up there in the, the branches of that cherry tree eating those sweet white cherries. I can taste them even to this day. And I can see across the across Lincoln Avenue over on the other side of the school building, I can see that Ferris wheel still turning around. And I can smell the cotton candy of the carnival. And I can see those pennies bouncing off that penny pitch. And, uh, I hear my grandmother pull gone bingo from the bingo tent. And if I listen very carefully, I can hear the, the steel wheels on the, on the steel rail of the old streetcar as it stops in front of that little, little uh, 
non-stemming marker there in the 1700 block of Virginia Avenue, the one that says 3H, 3W, and halfway mountain, halfway between Hagerstown and Winsport. 